First of all, <laughs> okay. um, starting with your comment, just uh, responses to, to Earl. I mean, Earl is, is in many ways um, the, the catalyst for our gathering here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I see him very much as a, a man of achievement, but also a hugely symbolic figure for lots of reasons. Tell us about your, your knowledge of him, both as a member of an audience, but also as a, probably a, a colleague in some way? Yes, I, I, I'm, I have to say that at this time, my, um, I've seen more of him here than, than I saw as we were, were, as we were uh, in the same business and working together. But um, I remember at the time when Earl was famous, when there was this wonderful black actor, because a lot of the time, most of the time, I grew up with American actors, black and white. In, in, in the West Indies, and even as I came here in, in Guyana, even when I came here first, the, the films weren't British. We didn't see a lot of British films, English films. They were kind of like the poor relation of the whole, of the, of the, the, the uh, establishment. So um, when Earl came on the scene, when we first heard of Earl, I came here in 1951, and I started in the profession in about 55, 58. And at the time, all films were American. And then we, then I can't remember what was the first time, no, Sapphire, we called it Sapphire. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Sapphire came on, and there was this incredible actor who, apparently was American, sounded American, but in fact we were told he is British. And we, we were absolutely blown away by this incredible person in our midst, in our midst, one of us who had that kind of, um, uh, 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 who was in, in a way um, representing the best of what was possible amongst us, because we were all struggling, we were all trying to get on the scene, we were all trying to make our names as actors and people in, in, in society anyway. It took a long while for a, a, a lot of us to, be es to become established, but there was Earl Cameron, and I, I have to say that up seeing him today just threw me right back into the times when the struggle was not just, not just to be to get the job or to be seen as equal members of, of the society and capable of doing what I've just seen Earl do at that time. Those were my days looking up and thinking, gosh, there's one of us that can do this. This is where I want to be. This is where I think that I am capable of and my contemporaries at the time we, we, uh, there were a few of them were mentioned uh, as we uh, um, talked about in the film. But what can I say? I'm just absolutely sitting here, like the rest of you, blown away by what I've seen just now. I really am. And Earl, Earl for me, is, is the, I, love, I must tell you, <laughs> some years ago, I, I, I I am, I am a member of Buddhist society in, in, in Richmond, and Earl lived uh, on the road, I think if I remember rightly, going from, in, in one's word, going along to, uh, in, in, to my um, organization in Richmond, and I knew where Earl and his wife and family lived. They were very, very up, and in, in, in my estimation, they were the, Earl was the pinnacle this is where we all wanted to be. This is what we all could possibly be. And I took it upon myself to go and knock on the door. I knew that where he lived, and I thought I would go and visit. And he was the most generous, embracing, and wonderful human being. I knew that I was being, um, you just don't do that. You don't decide you're going to go and visit somebody because you think the world of him and you know where he lives and stuff like that. And I went and we sat there and he spoke. But I always had the feeling that he was like, like a father. He embraced me 
and made me feel comfortable because I'm sure he knew that I was, I was out of my depths in a way. And I was sitting there, kind of, you know, totally in awe. But he never, he never, that person, I could, I'm sure you could see beyond all the performance, you saw the generous spirit that he was. You saw the, the I call him the emperor. That is how I saw him in, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person I could relate to, as the emperor. I bowed to him. He was the pinnacle of what I wanted to be. That for me was Earl. I, I, want, to, I, I want to come back uh, really to talk about that spiritual path you took, in, you've taken in Buddhism mm -hmm. and Earl's own in the Baha'i, just to talk about that in, in a while as an interesting kind of a combo with your career as an actor. But let me ask Lola. Lola, um, you, you wrote a, a wonderful book, uh, which is what, 25 years old this year, called Fear of the Dark, looking at film, black performance on film in the 40s and 50s. Can you just, again, just give us a, a response, uh, a little riff on, on Earl and what you, you feel about him, both as an ex-actor, but also as an academic? Yes, and th thank you, Bert, and, and thanks very much, Carmen, for your um, uh, story about meeting him. It, it's very reassuring in lots of ways. Yeah, so um, uh, I was I was actually I started off as a as a as a doctorate study of uh, race, gender, and sexuality in post-war British cin cinema. And although I was born and brought up here in the in in the fifties, and like you, Carmen, of course. Black people were American, right? Because you didn't see any of us on 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 the uh, television, and so I started sort of digging around trying to find these um, old movies. And I I did keep seeing Earl Cameron. I didn't write about him very much, to be honest. But um, although Sapphire, which I know you're talking about in the week, was one is one of my favourite films ever because it's just so bizarre. As a, you know, just such a as, as kind of standout island on uh, as a British cinema. Why that 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 theme of passing? Why that took hold of Basil Dearden, who was of course the same director as um, as um, uh, Pool of London. So yeah, he when I would say to people what I was doing studying in British cinema, they would say, well, there aren't any black people in British cinema, are there? And I said, well, yeah, there are. And although, I, again, I note from your programming that there's a couple that I missed oh. um, um, when I was writing about it. So Earl Cameron did stand out as obviously somebody with immense uh, charisma and actually very different to Paul Robeson, who was the only other uh, black actor with whom most of us were familiar in the 50s and 60s. And so writing about all of this in the mid-80s, it was really interesting to see this guy Earl Cameron, who wasn't um, an African-American, but who was, as it were, as, as Carmen has so eloquently said, one of us. So he was, he was very important in that respect. And I think this, this reclamation and celebration is so, so important. And in a way, it reminds me of that, um, you know, that historical work. It's that digging, almost literally in some occasions. I remember sitting in the basement of the BFI looking at all this stuff on the Steenbeck, you know. But, but, but that, that digging is so, so important. And if you've seen, anybody who's seen Summer of Soul, right, you know, that we, we know a little bit about the story of how that was buried for years and years. How much more of our stories here have been buried for so many years? And I think this story of Earl Cameron and others like Johnny Secker, Louis Mahoney, you know, there are all of these other black actors that people don't know anything about from... from that period and a little bit later, so really, really important to reclaim them. And in a way, I think um, perhaps Earl Cameron would stand out as the, well, you use the term pinnacle. I think that's right. It's, it's like emblematic of all the struggles of, of the, the uh, desire to play parts, not where you're always a goody two-shoes, but characters that have some dignity, yeah. have some depth and aren't um, these kind of representatives of this sort of primitivist idea of what black people are. So very, very important in the um, history of um, black performance on stage, on, um, on television, and in film. And you know, Carmen, uh, I, I know that uh, you're really sort of half a generation or a generation after Earl. But uh, just to follow from what Lola said, um, 
as a community, did you feel when you began in 1958, you said? Uh, I'm I think it was thereabouts. But did you feel part of a co community memory. of actors? Yeah. I mean, I, well, I, I think it's worth kind of giving a shout out to, to names like. Uh, yes, I worked with Johnny Secker. With, with Johnny Secker? Yes. Cy Grant. It's Cy Grant. Edric Connor. Uh, Joan yeah. Hooley. Yeah. Um, you know, people mm -hmm. who uh, may not have, this, have had the same profile as Earl, but were there doing amazing work. When you, whenever you caught it, or you see it in, mm -hmm. in the archive. But did you feel uh, you were entering a community of, of, of black, of Caribbean, yes, of yeah. uh, African yeah. actors? Yes, we were, uh, we, we were, uh, um, how can I, you, you were made a community. Do you know what I mean? Whether you liked it or not. But mm -hmm. then it suited us, because that's who we are. That's how we behave. That's in, in our, the nature of, uh, that's what I feel so myself. It's a question of survival. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, indeed, and, and safety in numbers, if you see what I mean. And there were people who were um, really, you mentioned Edric, but there's, there's a, I would like to bring, a mention here, Pearl Connor, mm -hmm. Edric Connor's wife, who was a, 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 how can I, a giant, a giantess, I feel like. She was absolutely so strong and so firm in making it possible for us, the, the, the upcoming uh, artists, to be seen, to be, uh, to be uh, paid properly, to, to get the parts that we need. And, and amongst us, you know, we the West Indian Students' Union was, uh, was one, of, uh, uh, one of the places that, uh, where you could find like-minded people because not just in the acting profession but there were people in all professions all over uh, uh, England the, the Scotland Ireland where, wherever wherever there was a, a person of color you knew them you knew of them it was by we are by nature we want we not the, not the herd instinct. I don't want to use it, make it sound like that. But you always reached out. If you made it, or if you found it, or found that you shared it. So we were we had that was our strength, that we shared, and we were very much aware of what the other person was going through. So there was never any um, there, there was ne it, there wasn't a problem with supporting. It was natural to us. Because we were we we were the strangers, and we had to work together if we're going to make anything happen at all. And anyway, I I was brought up with a sense. Um, <coughs> I was born in in British Guyana. I was brought up in my family, my parents, and my peers and headmaster and everything, with a sense of my own identity. I never felt at any time that I didn't belong anywhere. Because it's, it's not the place that made me. It's my family, it's the way I thought, it's the way I was brought up, the way I was educated. That is what sustained me. I didn't feel dependent. Wherever I was, I felt it was natural for me. If this is where I want to go, I will go because of my Desire. I wasn't brought up in a in, in, in a country where the there weren't. Um, how can I put it? All the people that I thought uh, much of, all the people who would be able to bestow anything on me, were black. Do you see what I mean? And so when I came here, and I found that we were uh, what we what we created here amongst ourselves, and uh, is that that idea that you. You have an identity. You have you strong enough to know that I belong wherever I am. It's not dependent on the largesse of anyone. Is it like the, the psychology it, of coming from a black majority culture yes. to a place where you think you belong, but in fact you end up being part of a beleaguered minority? Yes, but at the same time, there was, there was how can I put it? That made us even stronger. The fact that we were beleaguered, it made us even strong, for me, more determined 
that this is, this is not real, this, this should not be. Everyone must be regarded for who they are. And black for me was not who I am. That's the color of my skin, you know. That's not who I am. What is black? Uh, no, and a person isn't a, a black person. It's what you're looking, you're seeing the color of my skin, but you don't know me. And it felt, it felt amongst us, especially with Pearl Connor and the, the group that we formed, the, uh, uh, like Horace James, Charlie Hyatt. Um, um, Nadia Katoos. Si, si, sorry? Nadia Katoos. Na, Nadia Katoos, the um, Cy Grant, and all the, the, those people. We were quite, okay, we know we were beleaguered, but there was something, something that we, we came here with, something is, it's indescribable. Something that made us, that made us strong, determined that you will succeed. A lot of, a lot of, oh, we were, um, there were a lot of casualties, I have to admit. I don't know if you know, you know, you know that. There were a lot of casualties. At the same time, those were people who they were struggling. We were all struggling and it was hard. But some people, some fell by the wayside. But what the what the way we the way we survived, the reason we survived, and I think we did, the reason we survived, and the reason we were able to make a difference, because there were lots of people. I can't go into the the the, the titles and the names of people. We were able to survive because we had we were facing. Not not a say an enemy, but we are facing hard times, and that made us even stronger. Yeah. It, it made us. It made us. We found a way to step up and be counted. Be, but well, if I may, I mean, we were we were not when I was acting was a kind of cohort after yours, your group not quite a generation, but a significant difference. And again, you know, you can reel off the names. Again, you can say there were some who, who were casualties of yes. the, the, yes. the difficult situation Sad. which you faced. But many of both, both of our cohorts were activists as well, because within the union, within <coughs> equity, and, and you know as well how many different committees and what have you we used mm. to sit on to try and get what used to be called integrated casting, mm -hmm. and um, to try and convince uh, television producers and film producers who would always come up with this thing of, yes, but you can't have integrated casting because, I mean, I mean, you couldn't have a black man paying a bank manager, could you? And it was always that example, mm -hmm. Sam, it was really weird, and, and sort of the psychology of that is something else. But I mean, there was that, it, 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 there was this burden of uh, responsibility and representation. And that's so it's an added layer on top of being um, an actor striving to get work, which is difficult enough in itself. Yes, and, and, well, Lola, and proving you, yourself as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as an artist. You, you, you gave up acting. How, 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 good, how did you do that? How do you manage that? I just said, I'm not going to pay another nurse, prostitute, or black <laughs> um, bus conductor. That's it. That was it. I had enough. The, the reason I ask, uh, it's, it's, not just, it's not just a trivial question. Mm. I feel there's something very um, driven, something almost sort of, a, it's like an avocation in us who perform that, you know, we, we, we have to, in a sense, embody those spirits of voices which would not be heard otherwise, which keeps us going. It, it, it's a weird form of optimism. But in a way, I always feel that uh, actors, actors can never retire in a way. Because there's something in our in our imaginations, and in our in, in our hopes, which always is always driving us towards this kind of bearing witness to those voices and characters who would not exist for that hour and a half on the stage, that 20 minutes and casualty, unless we gave them life and breath. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess um, uh, well, I did give it up. And so I suppose you can think about how you might embody all those things in a different way. So, and still retain a sense of being a creative person, because uh -huh. to me, that's the larger thing, uh -huh. is about having to be creative. I cannot not create things. 
uh, whether that's through writing or, or podcasts or whatever it is. You know, something has to be done and that comes out of my head. I can't stop doing that. But the particular form that was available at that time, and I would say actually, particularly for black women, is not that different now. Um, it, it was the, the, the limitations that were put on whatever your acting range or, or interests or sensibilities might be were totally, totally unacceptable. And, you know, I did a lot of television, I did rep theatre, I paid my dues, I did all of that stuff, you know, three different plays working on them at once. And after all of that, you get offered, you know, as I say, a prostitute, a nurse, and a bus conductor, a few lines each, not interested. There are other ways in which I can be creative and contribute to this ongoing struggle, if you like. Because, you know, I, I've always found in Earl's story, which is, hasn't been really much talked about anyway, I mean, <clears throat> in public or when people talk about, uh, you know, Star and Black actors and so on, but his, his retreat to the Solomon Islands in service to the Baha'i faith um, as an exemplar of this world religion which uh, his, uh, his colleague talked about. Um, and uh, I know he came back because of a, a family tragedy and he picked up his, his career again. But the fact that he could walk away for 15 years, um, a man from Bermuda ends up in the Pacific on an island. And Carmen, I, I, I don't want to make any assumptions about his motivation other than just take the obvious that here was someone who saw this pursuit of spirituality as being as profound as working in you know, a James Bond film or working with a, you know, a whoever, working with David Hemmings uh, as a young boy. But Carmen, you're, you're, you, you follow a similar twin path in spirituality and artistic yes. pursuit. How, how was that, how was, has that informed your work as an actor? How is it, has it, what, what has it done for you as an artist? It has made, um, it, it, doesn't inf it, in, it doesn't inform my work as an actor. It informs my life as a human being amongst other human beings. Do you see what I mean? Because acting is, it's, it's learned. It, well, it could be natural for some people, but it's, quote unquote, your profession. It isn't who you are. An actor is a person who acts, and not a person who is. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a, there is, there's a level at which your life is, and that my Buddhism is more important to my life on uh, uh, amongst other human beings on this planet and in the uh, in the universe it does not inform my acting any more than it informs my life because i act from where i am it's not something i put on i come from here i from inside out that's the kind i'm not acting because there's a something that's been spread over me, and that's something that I've absorbed. It's something that I create. The performance comes from here. It's not put on me. And so therefore, B Buddhism is about life itself. Everyone here, as far as I'm concerned in my, as in my practice, everyone here, as we sit here, is my life. Everyone here. It's part of my life because everyone here is part of the 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 the, the whole the wholeness that is life itself. There's no separation, and that for me is that that is how can I? Read? It's the human being that is as large as the universe. That's who I am. And it's interesting how the path that you are following that uh, Earl followed was also followed similarly by Cy Grant, who did some amazing work on, on Jungian psychology, mm -hmm. amongst other things. But Lola, how, how did your acting, how has your acting career infected, affected, inflected your life in the House of Lords uh, and as an academic, <laughs> as, a, as a campaigner? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, hmm. 
Uh, well, I suppose going back a bit further than that, um, uh, I, I guess um, I guess you learn tricks as to how to present. And um, so when I was a lecturer, actually, I found it really useful. And um, uh, I hope, at least, that I gave uh, students uh, a little bit better experience than some of the lectures that I'd observed uh, in terms of being able to um, project my voice, for, for example. Um, but it's also, again, taking it to that wider creative thing for me. It's about just thinking in slightly different ways, I always find, um, and be a being able um, to give my imagination free reign, even in politics and activism and campaigning. There's, there's certain ways of thinking that are very firmly entrenched. You know, you think about policy making in this way, you think about legislative frameworks in this way, you think about regulatory mechanisms in this way, and these are, these are how you voice them, these are how you get them, this is how you get them across, this is how you speak to people about them, and this is how you campaign about them. And I think, wipe the slate clean, let's think about how we can actually um, uh, support people to understand different ways of thinking about the predicaments in which we find ourselves, and therefore think about new ways of getting out of these horrible predicaments in which we find ourselves. So, um, and I think for me that that and I, I don't I'm not a religious person in any way, shape, or form, <coughs> but I do uh, believe strongly that in 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 and that's not belief in, but but I do have a very keen sort of sense of politics, and I've had that since I was very young, um, uh, watching television, watching uh, apartheid South Africa refine its violence, watching Jim Crow America and civil rights struggle on television. I could sense that there was something really vile going on, and I didn't want to be that person who would say, oh, that's horrible, and turn away. So even though I'm not very brave, I'm not brave at all, but there are ways in which I feel I can use my mind and my, um, uh, yeah, the way I think and everything to, to change the landscape and to help people to change the way in which they think about things and therefore think of better solutions to, to what's gone wrong. There's a very resonant line from uh, the St. Lucian poet, Derek Walcott. Mm. I had no nation now but the imagination. Yeah. And it seems to me a lot of people in politics have lost their imagination. Yeah. They become apparatchiks, they become mechanized kind of um, you know beings. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you, you haven't lost your engagement with the imagination. It's still your nation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But uh, one of the things that um, uh, Earl, despite you know, the work we saw and his, his capacity and what he achieved, one of the things which irked him, and it's a kind of a debate which is still current, but in a reverse way, the current thing is that uh, a lot of African American actors, <laughs> most infamously Sam Jackson, thinks all these guys coming over and taking our parts, playing Martin Luther King and playing, uh, you know, in, 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 in movies, playing Americans, they're teething our jobs. Uh, there's some, a weird kind of notion about being an American with an experience of American slavery. It's like the African-American mind has become so parochial. They've lost a kind of Pan-Africanist view. But in the 1950s, um, I know that Earl and his uh, contemporaries faced a reverse problem. A lot of African-American actors were coming to England to take parts in British movies, mainly because the money was coming from America. I think of films like The L-Shaped Room, um, The Hill, where you had these uh, um, American actors. I mean, even, even a film like Queen and Country, with Denzel Washington playing a guy from Tottenham. I mean, it just it didn't work, did it? <laughs> what, 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 what are your thoughts on, on, on this whole notion of uh, the fluidity of actors and acting. Yes, because you see the thing quite, quite simply. I even in 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 British Guiana. I knew more about American actors and American publishers and American everything was American. There was um, well almost everything except that the, the, whole, the whole concept of, of, of Guyana was kind of like, is, this is a British colony. But, and this, 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 uh, this, this American theme that flows through, it's the, I can't, 
all over the world. The aim is to do what the Americans have done, are doing. It's changing now. It's absolutely changing. People are coming into their own, and they know they have, they have, they have uh, uh, the capability to create a society that, that essentially mirrors who they are and they don't have to be American or any other. You know, we've got, we are there now, you will agree. Nobody in Africa, I don't uh, I imagine, mostly wants to be American. We have people who are in Africa can do exactly what has been done in, in America. The question is, do you know them? Are they to the fore? America has been kind of, the, considering how young America is in terms of the rest of the world, they have made it made it so that theirs is the, 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 their, the, the, the themes, everything that in society is about who they are. It has permeated the entire world, yeah? The, the wonderful thing that is happening now is that we are beginning amongst us and in, in, in most nations of the, on this planet to see who and be who we are, who we are. We're finding out who we are and who, what we are capable of. And it doesn't have to be American influenced. It has to come from who we really are. For me, that for me is, is a, uh, uh, is, that's the ultimate in what Buddhism, my practice of Buddhism is. Who are you? What do you know of the human being? <clears throat> How do you be human? How do you behave as that? How have you found the place that you are in the, in the universe? We're all one family. Some people have progressed more than others. Some people look different than other people. But we are all one family. The question now is, how do you express yourself? What have you found about yourself that you can express that could uh, entertain as actors, that could cure as doctors, that could fix uh, situations as, as politicians and so on and so forth? That's, that's, that's how I see who we are. So when America, I can understand Ebony Magazine was the one, the most wonderful magazine that I grew up with in Guyana. We must have an ebony magazine, which meant that I knew more about the American uh, uh, situation and behavior uh, in the arts and everything. When I came here, I thought it was so kind of like, oh, it's kind of like backward. Uh, <laughs> America was out there. America, everything came from America. So when you talk about the American actors and so on and so forth, I can understand how they must feel now because they were the pe actors uh, and uh, people in the arts and the music and everything, everything was American, okay? Then I, 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 I come here and I realize, oh, it's not the same. There is a, another level, but uh, there's another level of relating to society, another level of, of thinking of who I am, which in fact is where my parents were. My parents were more British than the British. I was, I was brought up. I, I came through the whole, the whole system being more American in, in thinking as a, as a young person, in teenager, is you, you did, everything was American. Just after the war and everything, you got a, a new look and this and that. everything was American. But essentially, my upbringing was very, very British, not English, just British. And that meant achieving in a different way, living a, a, your, your life at a level, this is how it, uh, I found it, this is how we interpreted it, uh, living your life at a, at a level that was, um, that could embrace uh, all that was, uh, all that is possible, you know, no surprises, you know you can deal with any situation. When I came here first, and, and the first job in 1951, 
I had just left um, Enterprise High School, just got my senior school certificate. I was engaged and coming up and I'm gonna get married. And the, girl, the woman who, was, this is just an example of what, how, we, how we thought. I, she, we, um, she's going, uh, my, uh, uh, coming, she's gonna be my sister-in-law and marry her younger brother. And we were working, uh, living in Tooting and you've got, you've got to find you a job. I came in September, four days before the, uh, the end of the World Fair, you know, 26th of September. And we were going out, she said, oh look, there's an um, assistant librarian um, at the library, just, just in the main road from where I am. And um, let's go in, let's see. Well, it dawned on, it, later on, much later living here, I thought that was a very progressive idea that she thought, yeah, you were educated, you had your Cambridge this, that, and the other. So yeah, it could be it. And it would never have occurred to me that I could not be an assistant librarian. That was my, that's where I'm from. It would never have occurred to me, it didn't matter where I am on this planet, if that was what the job was and I wanted to find a job, that's how I was brought up. It, it's not unique. There are a lot of, uh, 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 quote unquote, West Indians, Car Caribbeans, Caribbeans, whatever. We were brought up with this sense that you're not less than anything or anyone. You can do it. That's how I, 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 I see myself. And this is why I, I, I so admire this man. He's, he was quietly in charge, you know? in a situation where it was difficult even to, to uh, add for uh, anyone to stand next to a, a black person, no dogs, no Irish, no coloreds. But when, you, when I think of um, Earl Cameron, I think of a person who never thought that he was less than. Even if he was in a situation where he was ma being made to feel that he was, and that he, he would be the last person considered for anything, for any job really, by dint of hard work and that firm belief in yourself. This is where, this is where we come from. This is what we were taught in, well, in Guyana, myself. I'm sure that any West Indian or a Caribbean sitting here at my age could hardly disagree with me. This is where we came from. This is how we were brought up. I never felt, never, from the time I started, came here in the early days and, and the business of, oh, the colored and the this and the black and this. In here, I felt it, I could do it. I could be it. I will do it. It has always been like that for me. And I feel that there, there's a, 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 my generation, I think, there was, there was that. Because otherwise we could not have made the steps that we made. They were pioneers. People were going out and doing jobs and disregarding whatever was the norm or the accepted behavior. We walked through it like a storm. Whatever it was, we walked through it and went to the goal, went to where we wanted to be. Of course, there were always, there's always going to be, um, no, you can't, oh, oh no, we don't, oh no, not you. And that was, that was, those were the stepping stones actually. Those were the, what was, how can I put it? It was almost as though it, it needed to be like that in order for us to do what we have to do. Let me ask Lola, can you just, just to conclude this first part of uh, this two-part panel, any, anything you want to say, any observations? Anything to, to do with the, this African-American, British um, acting sort of a brouhaha? It, it, it's an interesting one because I think it is, um, it, it's quite complex and multi-layered. Um, and I think, you know, so my first sort of question on that is, to, to Samuel Jackson et al., um, is, is okay, where, 
you tell me where that question is coming from and why it is you feel that way about this particular situation, which after all, we're not talking about hundreds and thousands of black British actors swamping, Oops. if I can use that term, if I can reappropriate that term, swamping Hollywood. It, it doesn't, it's not happening like that, and it's certainly not happening, happening like that for black British women who are actors. So, you know, where does this question come from? However, I would also say that going back um, to the time sitting on the Afro-Asian Committee of Equity mm -hmm. in whenever that was, the 80s, 70s and 80s, we did have those questions. You mentioned um, a Denzel Washington. It was Forrest Whitaker played um, a, a Tottenham squaddy, actually. Um, and um, and uh, there was this constant thing about, Actually, you know... He also wasn't meant to be a cricketer. And he, that he, was he it. didn't know to bowl. <laughs> was, was that the um, crying game? That was, so that, that was the, the, the Neil Jordan film. Yeah, and that was in the 80s. Yeah. He'd run so, up and so he was So that was still happening over. because there was this thing about black actors weren't sufficiently experienced. I wonder why, um, why they uh -huh. might not be. Uh -huh. But, yeah, so I, I, I think... And then there's also this thing of... For African Americans, that thing about identity is is obviously different, and I would also say, you know, there's different identities within Black communities here too, and different sets of experiences, and you can hear echoes of this kind of, how come they get, or how come this group get, and to me, it kind of comes back to your classic divide and rule. For as long as we're arguing with each other, mm -hmm. we're not actually focusing on what the main issue is. And I think that's problematic. The main issue is actually that there still aren't enough varied and demanding and interesting roles for black people or people of color in the, any film industry across the world, apart from within the continent, Africa, and the Caribbean, mm -hmm. such as those film industries are. So it's like, you know, we're all in the same boat, as it were, actually, um, with, with slightly different nuances. But um, it, as I say, I think it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a way of thinking to which I would ever want to really subscribe, because I think that it, it's a path to nowhere. Mm -hmm. If you start saying, so I could say, well, why? How come you come over here and and star in one of our movies, and that, that's not right? And so, what are we into then? Kind of color-based quotas or something? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. So I think people have to examine themselves and think about where those kinds mm. of statements come from, and what it is that they're really carping about, and how can yes. we actually do something. Um, you know, solid and sustainable mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that particular problem, yeah. and to move the, move the whole the whole subject further on, yeah, yeah, and, absolutely, and not be kind of um, beca sometimes you feel it's a, it's a plot, <laughs> you know, fight amongst themselves, they get nowhere. It kind of <laughs> it's um, to move the whole black American English what's 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 a Black English, Black American, Black whatever, whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a diversion. It's something that is. Um, it should not have. You shouldn't have two seconds of thought. Go beyond that. Go to the deeper level, and and think that all the, all of what's the film industry anyway? What is the film industry? How does it compare with a life? A real life, you know. So go beyond that. Go a little bit deeper. Find your own place in not not in not only in the film industry. Find your own place as a human being on this planet at this time. Start from there. What is what then could be an uh, an, an obstacle? How could anybody be so different? That they can, that you have find yourself creating the distance between you and this other person. I don't. I'm no different from. I'm no not far away from Toni Morrison. I'm not far away from a, any of the the famous um, American ladies. I am who they are. Do you see what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I, and, I, and you know what I mean? We must stop talking about black Americans and black English. And t how the, how, what is a black American? Do you know? Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm going to have the, the, the relay race demands that I, the baton is passed on. <laughs> uh, listen, we could go on. Yeah. This, is what, this is why a, a lime is so interesting and important. But when you're in an institution, hmm. it becomes something else. Um, but I just want Lola just to conclude, uh, just to say a few words before we pass the baton on to our second pair of panelists uh, for this afternoon. Anything you just want to part with, uh, part uh, give, give us before you, you leave? Um, I suppose it, 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 it's, it's a more of a general sort of um, comment, really, or not comment, observation, maybe, which is that um, increasingly, I think, history is, is really, really important. And it's, to me, to try and get to grips with and understand our respective histories and to look at the past through these different frames, these different histories, and to keep excavating for them is is the way to get to grips with what we're stuck with or seem to be stuck with today. Because when you look back, you see that everything is always in a state of flux, right? Things keep changing. Things don't have to be the way they are because we, we keep finding out more things. We keep mm -hmm. digging deeper. We keep going back. We keep thinking forward. And the more that we, we get that sort of those frames of references right and I don't mean right in terms of correct you know only one way to see them that 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 will help us to understand and so for me when I look back at those films um when I look back at them in the mid 80s and even when I look back at them now I sort of think to myself you know what are the little bits of truth that come through those movies about what societies were like and what societies were thinking and what people, how people interacted at that, at that time that can tell us things about how we've gotten to where we are today and to be able to challenge the ways in which some people see us or react to us or interact with us and, and therefore set... Um, uh, uh, their policies around it. Just, just one very quick thing. I, it just struck me. You know the way that people spoke English then. It's an absolute classic. The, the young woman with old Cameron in the pool of London. I mean, so absolutely. I mean, people. Very few people talk like that, apart from the Queen today. And it's like, but you know, here's Lord Digby Jones telling Alex Scott that she shouldn't be dropping her G's and everything because that's not how you speak English. But nobody speaks English how they spoke even 40 or 50 years ago, let alone um, hundreds of years ago. And one of the best clips I've seen on television, I promise you I'll finish now, is Paul Robeson giving this little upstart BBC commentator a, a, a lesson on how to speak Shakespearean English because that guy was trying to tell him that he wasn't pronouncing um, uh, Shakespeare properly when he played Othello, right? So Paul Robeson gives him a lesson in Shakespearean, Elizabethan um, English, which is amazing if you ever get to see that. But I think the history tells us so much and we need to study that and use that to move forward. You might say history is our basic science. Mm. Carmen Monroe, yeah. Lola Young, Ladies and gentlemen,